Good evening and welcome. My name's Pip Nicholson and I'm the Dean at the Melbourne Law School and it's an extreme pleasure to welcome audiences at Melbourne and around the globe this evening. Let me commence by acknowledging that I work on the land of the peoples of the Kulin Nation and that I pay my respects to their elders past, present and to their emerging elders also. And I acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which you are located and acknowledge their elders also. It's an extreme pleasure to welcome you to the 2021 James Merrill's Visiting Fellowship in Law Lecture. You will shortly hear from our guest spe speaker, Professor Doug Arna, and following the lecture, there's an opportunity for questions in the Q&A session that will be chaired by my wonderful colleague, Associate Professor Andrew Godwin. Before I formally introduce the guest speaker tonight, just a few housekeeping matters. The chat function has been disabled, but if you want to ask any questions, please do submit them through the Q&A function. Also a note that this evening's uh, presentation is being recorded and will be available on our website shortly. Can I commence the proceedings by uh, a note uh, and some comments about this particular lecture? The James Merrill's Visiting Fellowship in Law Lecture was established in honour of James Merrill's AMQC an alumnus of Melbourne Law School. I met Jim Merrills several times, a man with a keen intellect, a nuanced conversationalist, an incredibly witty and extraordinarily generous man. But significantly, and uh, the reason for which we honour Jim Merrill through this lecture series, is he worked as a barrister for 56 years and a silk for 42 of those years. In his extensive practice in constitutional law and equity, Jim developed a reputation for erudition, tireless preparation and uncompromising integrity. Of the many accomplishments of a lifetime service to the law and to the profession, one stands out in particular. Jim's editorship of the Commonwealth Law Reports for an extraordinary 47 years, which is a sustained achievement on any measure. From 1969 until his death in 2016, every reported decision of the Australian High Court passed through his hands, representing almost half of the entire life of the court. Jim insisted on concise, comprehensive, clear and unerringly accurate headnotes be prepared by the editors to the series and be vetted by him. And he has guided generations of barristers and judges as a result of the reporting of that series. I will also note that uh, he's guided and many students have benefited enormously from the publication. We are forever indebted to Jim Merrills for his unstinting dedication, his outstanding contribution to the legal profession and including scholarship and teaching within that. It is now an extraordinary pleasure for me to be able to introduce the Jim Merrills Visiting Fellow and our guest speaker for tonight, Professor Doug Arna. Welcome, Doug. Doug is the Kerry Holdings Professor in Law and Director and Co-Founder of the Asian Institute of International Financial Law at the University of Hong Kong. We were reflecting earlier that we last met in Melbourne, indeed, uh, over a convivial drink and how much the world has changed since that time. Doug is also Associate Dean, Faculty Director and Co-Founder of the University of Hong Kong's LLM in Compliance and Regulation their Masters in Corporate and Financial Law and Law Innovation Technology and Entrepreneurship Programs. In 2020, Doug was awarded an inaugural Hong Kong Research Grants Council Senior Fellowship to research the role of digital finance in financial inclusion and the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Over the course of his career, Professor Arno has published 18 books, more than 200 articles, chapters and reports, on international financial law and regulation, 
including most recently uh, reconceptualising global finance and its regulation with Ross Buckley and Emilius Abulius, which is a publication through Cambridge in 2016. And more recently, still the Reg Tech book with Jane Ospervarus and again Ross Buckley. Professor Arna was the inaugural member of the Hong Kong Financial Services Development Council 2013 2019 and director of the Duke HKU Asia America Institute in Transnational Law uh, over more than a decade. Doug has been involved with significant financial sector reform projects and undertaken visiting professor or fellow positions at universities around the world, including this one, the Melbourne Law School. Doug, uh, we're really honoured to have you with us tonight, joining us as you do from Hong Kong, and I am really pleased to host you for this year's James Merrill's Visiting Fellowship in Law. I look forward to the lecture. Thanks a lot, Pip. And uh, yeah, the, the last uh, time I saw you was actually uh, the first week of March uh, 2020. And I was uh, there visiting uh, and uh, I had had dinner with uh, Andrew uh, Godwin and Ian Ramsey, who I'll speak about in just a few minutes. And yes, I think we were supposed to meet uh, for a drink. And that incoming weekend was going to be the Melbourne Grand Prix. And that was the beginning uh, of Australia's uh, closure. Uh, and it was also my last trip uh, of, uh, since that point. And so, yes, I'm, I'm very sad um, not to have been able to uh, come down and visit you all uh, this year. It's the first time I think in over 10 years that I haven't been able uh, to do so. And so um, I think as with everyone else, uh, I'm very much hoping that uh, things uh, look better in 2021, the second half or 2022. Uh, and that perhaps uh, sometime in 2022, uh, we might all be able to meet up uh, somewhere uh, once again. And I wanna say, I think, um, uh, first, uh, thank you for the invitation to be here. And second, thanks uh, to the James Merrill's uh, visiting fellow in law uh, for, for sponsoring this. Um, it's something that uh, this topic is one that, that if Jim Merrill had a sort of wide interest, perhaps some of these issues uh, would have caught his attention. If nothing else, uh, I think COVID uh, and its impact on all things digital has been tremendous. And from the standpoint uh, of law, regulation and policy, there are both tremendous opportunities as well as tremendous challenges uh, coming out uh, of that. And so for me, uh, it's a huge pleasure uh, and honor to be asked to join you all uh, here uh, this evening. Uh, and it's unlucky only that we can't do it uh, in person. Um, and you know, I'd like to say as well that it's it's both happy and, and sad in some ways that uh, uh, two of my very good friends there who uh, and likewise uh, seen on that last visit, Professor Ian Ramsey uh, and Andrew Godwin, um, I understand are, are retiring. And so I'd like to take this opportunity, since I won't see them in person this year, uh, to, to both thank them uh, for their friendship uh, and support uh, over the years, uh, and also congratulate them on their contributions to uh, the University of Melbourne uh, and to the legal community. And I think both, regardless of their retirement, uh, formal retirement from the university, I know them well enough to, to say that they will continue working uh, and continue contributing both to uh, the university uh, as well as to uh, the broader legal community. And Ian in particular, Ian, uh, we met over 20 years ago at the inaugural conference of the Asian Institute of International Financial Law uh, here in Hong Kong. And we've stayed in touch uh, ever since. I came to, to, to Melbourne Law School uh, as a visiting fellow, uh, where I liaised with, uh, with Ian in 2007 to arrange. And from 2008, uh, I began teaching a course every year there. And Andrew, I met not long after he joined Melbourne. Uh, prior to joining Melbourne U, uh, 
Andrew had been uh, in practice in Shanghai. And so uh, common interests uh, across um, Chinese law, uh, East Asian law. And Andrew, as director of uh, the LLM program in banking and finance law, is one that I worked very closely with. And I should mention as well that actually the most recent book that has come out, the Asian handbook uh, of financial law, is one that Andrew and I co-edited uh, along with others uh, in Singapore uh, and Shanghai. And so from my standpoint, a long-term collaboration that I tremendously value uh, and two of my very good friends uh, that I'm missing uh, seeing in person this year uh, and looking very much forward uh, to seeing in person uh, again soon. And some of the topics we'll be talking about uh, will in fact be some of these issues relating to COVID and digital finance. And I wanna take this opportunity uh, to share some slides with you, which uh, I think may help. And these slides will be available uh, after the lecture for, for anyone uh, who might be interested in those. And I think if we think about COVID. COVID is something that we have to think of its impact in terms of finance and financial law, financial regulation in a broader context. And if we think about the past 10 years of finance and financial law, probably uh, your biggest drivers uh, over the past 10 years have been the global financial crisis, post-crisis regulatory changes, and technology. And the beginning of last year, before uh, COVID hit, even in China, here in Hong Kong, uh, I think I was outlining that I expected going forward that the 2020s would be dominated by three big issues from the standpoint of finance, financial law, and regulation. And those are sustainability, technology, and globalization versus uh, fragmentation. And I think, if anything, COVID has reinforced all of those trends. From the standpoint of sustainability, COVID is, of course, an existential sustainability crisis. It is a health crisis, a pandemic. And thus, one is thinking about how we respond to this crisis, but also how we build systems to build resiliency in the face of future crises. And I think. One thing that has quite surprised me out of COVID experiences over the past year has been just how quickly global attitudes towards sustainable development, particularly in the financial sector, both from the private investor context, as well as from the central bank and policy making maker context, just how quickly attitudes and approaches have changed. And so that very much from the financial sector standpoint, sustainability, sustainability objectives, sustainability regulation, sustainability compliance are going to be key issues. Likewise, I think an ongoing tension between globalization and fragmentation. Globalization was a trend really from uh, the late 1960s, uh, almost up to the present. But I think in recent years, we're seeing increasing tensions uh, as we reemerge into a world uh, of multipolar powers competing uh, economically, financially, uh, and in many more ways, and a real risk uh, of a world that fragments politically, technologically, economically, financially, and that this is going to be one of the big themes across the 2020s. The third, though, is around technology. And of course, I'm focusing uh, on digital technology issues today. And over the past five or six years, most of my work is focused on issues related to technology. I think if we think about uh, digital technology, 
even before COVID hit, we were already seeing a very different world for technology and finance. You know, we can think of a long-term process of digitization, of digitizing traditional finance, and over the past 10 years of the evolution of new entrants, fintech startups, but also the application of a wide range of new technologies from blockchain to big data, uh, AI and beyond. But I think by 2019, we were already entering uh, a new period in which technology is much greater in terms of scale and impact than we've ever seen before. And probably two highlights of this in 2019. The first was the announcement in the middle of 2019 literally two years ago by Facebook of its intention to create what would be the world's first global stable coin, a private cryptocurrency issued by one of the world's largest technology companies, which would then be usable for payments, not only across its platforms, but also across a range of other digital platforms uh, operating around the world. And I think even though central banks had been looking at new technologies in the financial sector for at least the past 40 years and very actively applying those technologies, particularly in the context of payments, the announcement of Libra was a seminal event in monetary history because for the first time, this was a credible private sector technologically based alternative to sovereign monetary arrangements. And that really highlights this idea of technological platforms and their ability to transform finance. The second event was in late 2019, and that was the designation by China's central bank, the People's Bank of China, of Ant Financial as a systemically important financial institution for regulatory purposes. What does that mean? It means that it is applying the same framework to too big to fail financial institutions, which emerged in the aftermath of the 2008 global financial crisis. And this, of course, uh, a tech platform. And this is a year before many of the other regulatory issues that Ant has faced and an ever wider attention, particularly from Chinese regulators. Implications of this even pre-COVID was an increasing range of new entrants and increasing speed of development. And the fact that things could move from what we characterize as too small to care, to too large to ignore, to too big to fail in record time. And I think when we think about the impact of COVID, perhaps one of the biggest aspects of COVID is that it has not been so far a financial crisis. It has not been 2008. Instead, that rather than being so far part of the problem, finance, and in particular digital finance, has been at the heart of our addressing lockdowns all across the world. And something that I think we're all very familiar with is how COVID has driven a digitization of everything. Clearly, we were already seeing this trend, this idea of the fourth industrial revolution and the digitization of everything pre-COVID. But I think COVID has really driven it forward in a way that as much more rapid than we otherwise would have seen. In many of these areas, as we turn to finance, what we have seen in just a year is what I would have expected in many cases to take place over three, five, or even 10 years. And I think some of the changes in attitudes in particular uh, are going to have a big influence uh, on issues going forward. And if I wanted to highlight the big legal and regulatory issues, as well as the technological aspects that are emerging from COVID-19, I would highlight 
four from the standpoint of finance. The first has been a dramatic increase in electronic payments uh, all across the world. The second has been a much greater comfort amongst regulators and supervisors in using technology for regulatory and supervisory purposes, as well as the financial services industry for compliance purposes, what we would call reg tech or soup tech about building better infrastructure. And we've seen this particularly in the context of anti-money laundering frameworks, what we, in the context of market integrity regulation. And as I just mentioned prior, previously in the context of platforms, an even greater acceleration of platformization across finance. I think when we look at payments, we can think of what we are seeing in digital payments over the last year as building upon developments really going back at least to the 1970s when we begin to see the rollout of large electronic payment systems in major economies at the wholesale level, but perhaps even further back than that. But certainly from the standpoint of centralized systems, not only RTGS, but fast retail payment systems, but also from 2009, the emergence of decentralized structures uh, and blockchain. And the application of these uh, both by private sector participants and in the context of what are called central bank digital currencies, the idea of essentially a central bank issuing its own digital money, that we are seeing these technologies absolutely revolutionizing payment. And of course, COVID has driven that because societies around the world have had to take advantage of whatever digital payment systems were already there in order to try to get resources to individuals and small businesses across the economy. Certainly, one can easily think about the example of the US a year ago, mailing checks to people without bank accounts and how ineffective that was from the standpoint of getting financial resources to individuals and businesses. And so we are seeing an increasing range of countries thinking about how can they build on this experience, not only of the necessity of digital payments in COVID, but how can they build better systems? And at the international level, these experiences combined with the impact of Libra has spurred a G20 project uh, looking at how one can build better cross-border payment systems, a recognition that the technology is there to build better systems, and it is simply up to us to focus on that. And I think very much this area of cross-border payments and remittances is where we're going to see some of the biggest changes going forward. When we think about reg tech uh, and soup tech, I think this is something that, you know, prior to COVID, this is an area where, as Pip mentioned with the reg tech book, uh, my team and I had been putting a great deal of attention. But sometimes it takes something to, to change the mindset. And of course, if we think about lockdowns around the world, lockdowns apply to the financial sector. They apply to financial sector customers, both retail and wholesale professional. They also apply to central banks and regulators working from home, dealing with their colleagues online, dealing with other agencies domestically online, and dealing with other regulators on a cross-border basis online, as well as dealing with the financial services industry online. And so, what we are seeing is, I think, a dramatic change in mindset from regulators and supervisors, which means that they are now much more comfortable and aware of how technology can be used for regulation, supervision, and compliance. And probably the biggest area we're seeing is a process in supervisors and regulators of digitizing their own processes, of digitizing their data collection systems, of 
digitizing regulatory reporting requirements and digitizing infrastructure, thinking about how can they build better systems that enable them to collect information better and perform their regulatory functions in a better way, while at the same time often reducing the costs and inconveniences to the financial sector of addressing these. And I think that over the next 10 years, this is likely to be one of the biggest regulatory transformations. And of course, reg tech and soup tech is something that doesn't just apply in the financial services sector, it applies in any aspect, any regulated industry, including things like communications, healthcare, transport, and of course, sustainability regulations. Taking that from the standpoint of infrastructure, I think another area where we've seen some fundamental rethinking as a result of COVID impact is around AML. And it's something that there's been a broad awareness growing uh, in sort of international processes, particularly at the G20 level, for some time that our existing systems of AML regulation and enforcement don't work very well. One, they cost a lot from the standpoint of the financial services industry, but ignoring the cost, the reality is that they're not actually very good at achieving their regulatory objective, which is preventing the criminal and terrorist use of the financial system. Our existing systems are largely built around frameworks whereby financial industry participants have to report certain transactions, either on an objective basis or a subjective suspicious transaction reports basis to regulators. Those regulators will often only look at those reports after something happens. They're not very good at preventing. And the end result is an increasing awareness by the end of 2019 that our existing system wasn't working very well. And COVID really required a change in approach because of working from home, non-face-to-face -face transactions and lockdowns from the standpoint of onboarding, monitoring and transaction reporting. And I think what we've seen is a recognition by the Financial Action Task Force, the FATF, the global standard setter, that digital systems are at least as good as paper-based systems. And we are also seeing increasing approaches which are more centralized at the regulatory level, building on digitization and big data arrangements, as opposed to putting the burden and relying from a regulatory standpoint on the fragmented and disparate approaches of individual financial institutions. I think we think about big tech uh, and tech fin. Obviously, uh, from October 2020, when we see the decision to stop uh, what would have been the world's largest initial public offering for Ant Financial, as a result of a range of regulatory concerns, we've seen increasing attention to questions around big tech in general, platforms in particular, and in the financial sector context, the role of platforms in finance. And I think what we're increasingly concluding is that there are tremendous potential benefits available from uh, platforms from the standpoint of data aggregation and customer benefits, but there are also tremendous potential risks from the standpoint uh, of things like cybersecurity, data protection, new forms of infrastructure, as well as restrictions to uh, competition uh, and innovation. And this is an issue that we're seeing focus uh, not only in China, but also in the EU, uh, the United States, and I think across the world. Now, if I'm thinking about going forward, in addition to the necessity of using digital finance to respond to COVID, there's also a lot of discussion about how we can use the COVID experience to build more resilient systems going 
forward to enable us better to withstand future crises, particularly sustainability crises, but also to actually support more effectively broader sustainable development. And I think where we are seeing that is really in four different levels. First, a focus on digitization. I think COVID has, Im uh, has highlighted better than anything else could the digital divide that exists between within societies and across countries, and just how essential it is to figure out ways um, all across the world to extend digital access to that last mile of every society in every country, because this really is the foundation of sustainable development, but also of resilience to future crises going forward. The second is around infrastructure, and I'll turn to that in just a second. From the standpoint of infrastructure, it is about building balanced proportional regulatory approaches to try to take advantage of both the benefits in particular of technology, but also to minimize the risks. And finally, to support the wider ecosystem, in particular through research and development and support for innovation. Now, if we think of uh, infrastructure, the key lessons that have come out of COVID are really that electronic payments are central, that getting those payments across everyone from a standpoint of business and individuals is key. Part of making that happen is what we think of as financial inclusion, that people have access to a bank account, a mobile money account, or at least some sort of digital wallet that enables them to make transactions and that small businesses are able to use these payment systems and these wallets as well as governments in order to digitize business and processes. Key to making this happen is digital identification, in particular systems of sovereign digital identification, which are also central to addressing those issues of market integrity and building better frameworks for AML going forward. This combination of digital identification, accounts, and interoperable electronic payments provides the rails for digitization of government services and processes. It also provides the rails, which reduces the costs of customer acquisition and enables new business entrants, new business models, which can in turn dramatically impact development. When we think of this idea of infrastructure, we in my team are doing an increasing amount of research, not only looking at simple things like crisis resilience, transactions, uh, growth and development, but looking more broadly uh, at the role of digital finance from the standpoint of sustainable development. And certainly from my standpoint, I focus very much on the sustainable development goals. This is a framework that I use and that we are looking at the impact of digital finance from the standpoint of its impact across all of the sustainable development goals. And I think it's a very interesting discussion that central bank roles have moved in just two or three years from focusing largely on traditional economic growth through monetary stability and financial stability to increasingly wider sustainability aspects. And if we think of the Bank for International Settlements, its most recent annual report has a focus amongst other things on the roles that central banks can actually have in the context of inequality. The roles that digital finance can play not only in poverty, but in gender equality, in innovation, uh, as well as in climate. Uh, and so I think this is something that when we think about digital financial infrastructure, we're thinking not only about supporting growth and the business community, but we're also increasingly thinking about how we can have an impact positive through digital finance on sustainability
more broadly. Now, thinking about this requires uh, an appropriate regulatory approach, including the use of technology for regulatory and supervisory purposes. But I think what is key is this idea of a risk-based proportional approach, that when things are small and not very risky, you allow a lot more. And as they grow bigger and more risky, that as they grow from that fintech startup into an ant financial, that one applies different steps, different regulatory approaches that are designed to balance the benefits with the risks. And I think if we're thinking of the wider ecosystem, we're thinking in particular of education and human capital development. We're thinking about research and development support and funding. We're thinking about building innovation hubs and regulatory sound boxes, as well as the wider legal foundations. And to conclude, I think as we look forward across the 2020s, these key issues uh, of sustainability, globalization, and fragmentation and technology are going to dominate many of our discussions about finance, financial law, and its regulation. I think in terms of specifics, these aspects of digitization, of payments, uh, of regulation and supervision, uh, of um, market integrity and infrastructure systems and the challenges as well as the opportunities of data, data concentration and industry dominance are going to be central from the standpoint uh, of research and writing. And I think that if we look at these aspects, it's something that in many ways uh, are core to the programs that are already being offered uh, at the University of Melbourne. Uh, it's something that I'm definitely looking forward uh, to speaking with my friends, uh, Ian, Andrew, Pip, and others uh, the next time I'm there, and that I hope uh, that James Merrills uh, might have found uh, of interest. Thank you all very much. Thanks very much, Douglas, for that broad ranging and thought provoking lecture. Um, those who are familiar with Douglas and his uh, huge um, uh, opus of, of work and research will be uh, will know that he's renowned for um, his ability to analyze the causes of financial crises and his skills in predicting uh, the future developments and that arises um, in areas such as fintech, reg tech, soup tech, and all other areas that have some impact from a technological perspective on the regulation of the financial sector. And one of the themes that um, struck me, Douglas, as you were speaking to us, is just the extent to which the past 18 months or so have, um, have, have constituted really a COVID-driven digitization, particularly in the finance sector. And so it's really interesting to reflect on the themes that you've touched on and also what, um, what, what, what is in store in the future. And um, Douglas, you are a bit of a guru in that sense, uh, in terms of being renowned for being able to predict the future as it impacts on financial, um, digital finance and financial regulation generally. So it's been really interesting to, um, to hear you this evening. Now we're fortunate now in having a good 15 or so minutes in which to um, explore some of the themes that you've identified. And uh, we do have quite a few questions that have come through. I thought maybe I might uh, kick off with a question of my own. Um, I know uh, that you mentioned at the outset that uh, unlike the 2008 global financial crisis, which really was the product of problems in the financial system, in the current crisis, really the financial system has um, been of crucial importance in areas such as payments, keeping economic activity going, keeping the payment system going. And so it's been very encouraging in that sense. Um, but I think um, as you've written about, uh, we, we're seeing an increased reliance or dependency on technology in the area of finance. And I'm interested to know to what extent you think that um, uh, at some point in the future, we might be facing a tech technology crisis um, and how might how we might mitigate or avoid the risks that might be presented for finance, financial regulation. Um, 
you spoke about, uh, for example, the increasing importance of sovereign uh, currencies, digital currencies, central bank digital currencies, as a tool, I think, for maintaining financial stability. But can we uh, maintain our confidence in the technology that underpins developments like that? And who knows what the next crisis might be? It might be a climate related crisis, it might be perhaps even a technological crisis brought about by issues to do with cybersecurity and other risks. Um, and so I'd be interested to hear your views on, on the concerns or risks that might arise out of the technology that we're using and how we might deal with that from a financial regulation perspective. Thanks for that, Andrew, and great to see you. Uh, it's, uh, uh, I think that's a great question and it's something that, um, as Andrew mentioned, I, I tend to focus on financial sector development and often what that means is that I'll spend some years working on uh, a new exciting innovation uh, of some sort uh, and then uh, it will eventually uh, all blow up uh, in some form and I'll spend the next few years uh, working on uh, how to have prevented that particular crisis uh, from happening. Um, and I guess in one aspect, if I think of 2020 so far, if we look back at the 2008 crisis, all those efforts that we put in to preventing another repeat of 2008, the good news is that in 2020, we didn't have any big banks or infrastructure blow up. And that's a good thing because we had enough problems uh, already without a financial sector crisis. Now, with that said, I think looking forward, there are a number of finance risks uh, that are, are already emerging. The first is the fact that over the past 10 years, all, uh, over the past year, all across the world, we've seen a real bifurcation in impact of COVID. Um, the wealthier, better off portion of the population everywhere has done not too badly, if I'm honest. The rest of the population has not. And this is something that I think from the standpoint of issues around inequality, um, you know, uh, divisions within societies, this has real risks going forward. And I think everybody working in the financial sector has to be aware that there is this bifurcation uh, and that this potentially is the genesis of its own crisis. The second, however, which relates to this, is we're seeing dramatic increases in asset prices of just about everything all over the world, uh, driven in particular by liquidity uh, from central banks and government provision of resources, which have been redirected by the better off parts of the port population, often into financial sector and other sorts of investments, driving up those prices all over the world. And I think this is something that we have to be concerned about uh, because asset price bubbles are one of your core causes of all sorts uh, of financial crises. The third, I think, Andrew, is as you exactly mentioned, is this prevalence of te technology. Uh, you know, digitization of everything brings with it risks. Um, obviously, transactions, regulation interactions, everything has become digital. But the other thing that has increased over the past year has been cyber crime uh, and cyber attacks. Most rapidly growing area of crime globally, cyber. Most active area in terms of threats. And if we look at this from the standpoint of financial security, individual financial institutions, if we look at this from the standpoint of financial stability, 
risks of a financial crisis, and we look at it from the standpoint of national security, digital finance is at the top of the list uh, of concerns. And one can think about some really rather unpleasant scenarios. And of course, the financial sector spends a great deal of time and money on trying to prevent these, but the reality is that small percentage chance of very bad outcomes. And that's something that I think we have to be very concerned about. Data concentrations. How are all of these data being used, both by the private sector as well as governments? And I think we're seeing increasingly disparate approaches across different countries and different societies to the way that data can be used, both by governments as well as by the private sector. And if I think of one of the biggest challenges for countries going forward is to think about how can you get the benefits of data aggregation without getting the problems that emerge from having someone controlling all of these sources of data. And finally, from the standpoint of infrastructure, all kinds of new systemically important infrastructure, not least cloud services. You know, we can think of any new entrant in the financial sector over the past five, six years is probably cloud native, but our big banks were in most cases still operating on 1970s COBOL running IBM mainframes. They were moving really slowly in changing that. But this past year and a half of COVID has driven a significant number of the world's largest financial institutions into cloud-based systems with a lot of good, but it brings with it new risks. Uh, thanks, Douglas. The um, answer that you just gave to the first question touches on a couple of uh, further questions that have come through, one of which relates to the digital divide that you alluded to before, and in particular, what uh, we might do in terms of building capacity in developing countries, because we are seeing a divide growing between the wealthy nations and the not so wealthy nations. and. Um, there was a question in relation to the catalyzation of the, the, the digital divide. In fact, I think it was a question that may have come from one of your colleagues in Hong Kong. Um, and what we might be able to do to build capacity in developing markets and developing countries. Um, and just while I'm at it, I might mention another question that uh, touches on something you mentioned during your lecture, and that is um, the growth of tech, big tech companies like Ant Finance. Um, uh, if you had any thoughts about uh, uh, the implications of the um, postponement of the IPO last year, whether that reflects on, for example, the uh, issues or concerns arising out of its power in the financial area. And um, I, I know you've spoken before about the concept that a financial institution is too big to fail. Are we confronting the same risk in relation to technology companies that they are now, many of them, simply too big to fail and how might we best regulate them and reduce the risks that arise in relation to that. So a couple of questions rolled into one, if I may, but um, your thoughts on those, please. I think you're on mute. Thanks for that, Andrew. Uh, and uh, I think I'll, I'll separate them a little bit. And first, uh, good to see some friends in the audience. Uh, thanks, Hamid, for, for that question. And I think from my standpoint, as I was emphasizing, I think when we're thinking about infrastructure more broadly, we need to be thinking about digital infrastructure often as core enabling for governance as well as private uh, activities. And I think this is one of those areas where there is a real role uh, for not only the private sector and in investment, but also from the standpoint of the public sector in thinking about how to build infrastructure. Now, this point about the digital divide, I think, is a really important one, because if we're thinking about it, the key sort of entrant, we're thinking about mobile phones, ideally smartphones, ideally internet access. And um, this is something that across Asia, the numbers are, are very good. Uh, large smartphone penetrations, uh, internet access improving, uh, the numbers of traditional sort of feature phones, quite small compared to, to what we see uh, in Africa. But the challenge in many cases is the portion of the population 
which has not been brought in often because it's been uneconomic to do so. And if we think about historically the mobile business model, it was initially about uh, charging monthly service fees, just like landline business. Then it really evolved to selling handsets. Uh, in other words, that you would make your money from selling the handset, which would then get the service fees and that would then support the expenditure to build the infrastructure. I think India's experience over the past five or six years has been tremendously informative and increasingly what we're seeing is that the business model is not driven by the monthly fees. It's not driven uh, by selling the handsets, it is driven by the data acquisition and the services that can be offered. Uh, and this, I think, is fundamental to realizing that the role of big tech in platforms can be very transformative from the standpoint of sustainable development because they're the ones, perhaps with governments and other investors, that will have the resources to put in from the standpoint of infrastructure, from the standpoint of towers and subsidized smartphones, which have become incredibly inexpensive as a result of Chinese production over the past 10 years, that is the basis of enabling access. Now, this is easier in big countries. Uh, it's easier in large land masses. But the basic idea of data as a justification for business is, I think, transformative. But even with that, there is more to the digital last mile. And that is uh, often those who are elderly, uh, minority groups, uh, illiterate, that have issues in terms of actually use and access. And Russia actually provides some really good examples here of how government resources focused on those last mile groups in the context of building a few towers here and there, because much of Russia is too big with too small of a population to commercially support the towers even on a data model. But because of the value from the standpoint of the wider society, government, and economy in having digital connection, particularly what we've seen as a result of COVID and education as well as finance, that it's actually worth the government going in itself to cover that. And finally, from the standpoint of illiteracy, at least from the standpoint of major languages, major languages are increasingly served by voice models. And that means that in major languages, that someone who is illiterate can probably use uh, a mobile phone, which is based on a voice model, and that then brings them in in a way that is not. The challenge is around smaller minority languages where the amounts uh, of money at stake are not as great, and that's probably a real opportunity for universities. Now, this other point on Ant. And I think this is really tremendous because Ant highlights both the tremendous positive aspects of platforms, but also some of their risks. And if we think about its emergence over the past 10 years, about 10 years ago, China decided to allow uh, an experiment in digital finance, a realization that China's traditional financial system its banks and its capital markets was not very good at directing financial resources to non-state enterprises and in particular small and medium-sized enterprises. And digital was seen as a pilot in the sort of traditional Chinese pilot experimenting approach that it might be able to solve that problem. We really saw two different directions. One was the sort of P2P, peer-to-peer -peer lending platforms. So that by 2018, China had over 8,000 of these peer-to-peer -peer lending platforms, more than the rest of the world combined. As a result of some financial issues that began to emerge in 2015, China's closed that particular experiment. And today there are less than 10 of those P2P platforms left. The other, was on the basis of digital payments. And we see in particular the entry of Ant, 
uh, with Alipay and Tencent with TinPay or WhatsApp Pay, uh, and the transformative effect that these had not only on the economy, but the society uh, of China over the past decade. And these have emerged as serving a, a billion people, uh, absolutely transforming everything about China, uh, particularly from a financial services and e-commerce standpoint. But by 2019, China was becoming concerned about these platforms really from two different directions. We can often think of the Chinese government as having objectives which are focused on a combination on one side of stability as well as development. And from a financial sector standpoint, that means a fear of financial instability, of financial crises. And so questions about the fact that the country had become very dependent for electronic payments on these two platforms and new tech risk in digital infrastructure and needed to reduce that dependence. Second, that the digital finance platforms had been tremendously successful in addressing that core question of getting financial resources to the non-state sector and small and medium-sized enterprises, but also individuals. Ant by 2019 had emerged as the second largest SME lender, one of the largest consumer lenders, and also the largest issuer of asset-backed securities in China's securitization markets. And so questions about whether the debt loads were getting too high and we might face some debt questions. And so if we think about this from the standpoint of stability, issues around infrastructure dependence, issues around excessive credit, which have been a real focus over the past two years, and from the standpoint of development. Core to Chinese government objectives today focuses on the role of innovation and development, and a fear that dominance by a small number of platforms would reduce competition and therefore reduce innovation in the society and the economy more broadly, something that studies from the Bank for International Settlements were already showing by 2019 in China and in the US in the context of Facebook and Amazon as well. So a decision in 2019, uh, sorry, in October 2020, to effectively fully bring Ant into the regulatory framework and the building of a complicated full regulatory system trying to balance both the positive aspects, transformative aspects of digital finance platforms, but also to reduce some of the risks that were emerging. Thanks, Douglas. And on the question of risk, we've had a couple of questions that relate to cybersecurity. And I thought in the remaining two or so minutes that we have, it would be interesting to get your thoughts on some cybersecurity as one of the big tech risks, as it were, um, and what we might be doing in order to reduce the, the risks that arise in that regard. And um, from a regulatory perspective, perhaps one of the greatest challenges is simply the extent to which regulation lags behind innovation. Um, and so we see this in areas like, um, well, a big topic of discussion in Australia at the moment is the buy now, pay later uh, innovation. Um, also, of course, we see it in relation to cryptocurrencies and crypto assets generally, that um, we're, we're still struggling to categorize them and therefore we don't really know how to regulate until we, we've got a label that we can pin on them. But of course, um, all of this is, is very much dependent on getting the cybersecurity protections in place. And that goes to the, quest, the, the issue you mentioned before and that is financial stability. So I guess you have these opposing forces at play and um, it's going to continue to be a challenge from a regulatory perspective to, um, to, ma to make sure that uh, we stay on the right side of the line. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. And you know, if I'm, if I'm thinking about the two biggest compliance issues today, where we're already seeing lots of new laws and regulations coming out and a serious increase in compliance burdens from industry, particularly finance, the two areas uh, are data regulations and uh, cybersecurity. This 
are probably the two currently most rapidly growing areas of compliance in, in finance. If I wanted to say what I think the next oncoming growth area in compliance and finance is going to be, it's going to be sustainability. This is something where we're just seeing the start of an avalanche of new rules. Good, but uh, it's definitely going to drive compliance. Now to this point about how do we sort of balance uh, risk and innovation, and I think this is core to regulatory objectives. If we think about the decade prior to 2008, we were all about innovation. Any innovation was a good thing. It all went pear-shaped in 2008. Um, Paul Volcker says the only good innovation he ever saw was the ATM machine, basically referring to CDOs and credit default swaps. And so we see a decade of regulation coming basically to stop any form of innovation. Uh, and regulators for a good 10 years from 2008, basically taking a very skeptical approach to any sort of innovation. Life is going to be more complicated in the 2020s. You have to balance these two things. You have to realize that one, the digital is not going away. Two, that there are some real benefits. But three, you've got to be constantly thinking about what are the risks. And that's really the role for central banks and regulators, as well as strategy and compliance teams within financial services institutions, law firms, advisors, uh, and the like. And I think from the standpoint of uh, Law reform, and I know, Andrew, that this is going to be your big focus uh, going forward. I think that there's a real need to, to take more functional or activities approach based as opposed to laundry list. In other words, in securities, if we have a laundry list of stocks, bonds, and debentures, uh, is an ICO a stock or a bond or a debenture? Well, really, who cares? It's an investment product. And so we should have something that basically says, regardless of what your technology is, and a stock, a bond, our technologies, no one's quite sure what a debenture is, um, but stocks and bonds, those are definitely specific forms of technology. You need to write laws so that they capture new developments. And so you focus on what are your regulatory objectives. You want to protect consumers. You want to protect investors. You want to look at financial stability risks. You want to look at market integrity risks. And I think this as well as the use of technology, requires a higher level of effort and thinking uh, from regulators, but it makes it a lot more interesting. It certainly does, Douglas. And the more we discuss the issues, I think the more interesting they become. But unfortunately, um, time is pressing and I must now draw the uh, lecture to a close. But let me finish by thanking you on behalf of Melbourne Law School, Douglas, for an excellent, uh, really thought-provoking and insightful lecture. It was the 2021 James Merrill's Visiting Fellowship in Law Lecture. Unfortunately, as everyone knows, circumstances uh, necessitated treating this year's fellowship as, as more a virtual fellowship than a visiting fellowship. But I do hope, Douglas, that it won't be too long before we see you again in person. And so um, please accept our online thanks in the hope that that will suffice until you get the opportunity to come back to Melbourne and we can thank you in person or hopefully in, in due course, I can travel to Hong Kong and catch up with you then. So let me thank you again um, and also just close by thanking all of you for attending this evening's lecture.